he did experience tragedy. Uh, that's hard, I think, for any of us to imagine. In, uh, in 1884, um, he had already risen in, in just two years to become the leader of his party in the New York State Assembly. Uh, and who knew what, you know, what beckoned. But uh, on Valentine's Day, 1884, he was summoned back uh, from Albany. And uh, he walked into the house and discovered that his wife and mother were both dying under the same roof. And in fact, both would die uh, that day. Um, he was uh, the father of a new infant uh, who was named Alice, whom he immediately abandoned, uh, along with New York and politics. He left New York. He went as far as he could go, which was Medora in the Badlands of uh, North Dakota, to a ranch that he owned. He lost half his fortune. He wasn't a very good rancher. He was never very good with money. Uh, in fact, the second Mrs. Roosevelt always had to pay all the bills and keep all the books. And Anyway, um, he may have been too imaginative. Um, he, there are wonderful stories of T.R. trying to fit in again, just as he had in the New York legislature. The, the, again, he was this odd, exotic, Easterner dude. He got his cowboy outfit from Brooks Brothers, <laughs> um, and he was very proud of it. It was very flamboyant. He got uh, pearl-handled revolvers long before George Patton uh, had the idea. And, there was, and, and he was referred to as Four Eyes, um, not unaffectionately by his fellow cowboys, uh, who thought it was hilarious. They watched him one day trying to corral uh, horses. Uh, and he was, he was on horseback, and he was sort of shooing them along. He said, hasten forward quickly there, um, which, was, which, <laughs> which was immortalized, you can imagine, on the frontier. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he, was, uh, he spent two years in near isolation, reading book after book after book, uh, disciplining his mind, expanding his horizon, and healing his soul after the, the wounds of, uh, of losing both his wife and his mother. Uh, he came back to New York in 1886 uh, to run for mayor, came in third in a three-way race. Um, more, more fortunately, the next year, uh, he was remarried to, um, to a woman named Edith Corot, Edith Kermit Corot, who in fact had been a childhood playmate of Theodore's. And they had at one point apparently had an understanding, and then he went off to Harvard, he met Alice Lee. Well, anyway, better late than never. Um, Edith was a remarkable woman, a great strength of character. Uh, and one needed great strength and character, I guess, to be, to be married to, to Theodore Roosevelt. Um, after the, uh, the failure of the New York mayoralty, he was invited to Washington and be head of the Civil Service Commission. We talked about a little bit earlier about the, the campaign to create civil service. Well, by the time um, in 1889, when Benjamin Harrison became president, there was, in fact, a federal civil service commission. T.R., the great reformer, uh, was invited to be its chairman. And he was, by all accounts, entirely too energetic for the Harrison administration uh, and most, most everyone else. Uh, there's a wonderful, um, he was also very indiscreet. He, he, uh, um, he couldn't keep a secret and he could rarely keep his mouth closed. Uh, there's a um, typical of his correspondence of the day. He, he had a sharp tongue and, uh, and a genius for invective. And um, one, one letter he, he wrote referred to Secretary X, a member of the president's cabinet, um, looks like Judas. But unlike that gentleman, has no capacity for remorse. Uh, anyway, you can imagine he made friends and he made enemies uh, in uh, roughly equal number. Um, he went back to New York, which was home, um, in 1895. And another great job for a reformer, for a moralist a crusader, basically commissioner of the New York Police Department which was as corrupt as anyone it was supposed to be pursuing at that time. Um, T.R. used to stay up all night. He would walk around the city, and he would find uh, patrolmen sleeping on the job and make sure they were fired. 
Uh, he introduced a bicycle squad, pistol shooting practice. He was, however, singularly unsuccessful in his great moral campaign to shut down the saloons on the Lord's Day. Um, Tammany Hall and their friends in the legislature uh, were infinitely um, uh, clever. Uh, they, they, uh, they passed a law to get around a ban on Sunday saloons that basically said that only hotels with 10 or more rooms could serve alcohol with a meal on Sundays. Now, that sounds like a real straitjacket, um, except <laughs> the ingenuity of, of New Yorkers. Within weeks, almost every saloon, beer dive, and dance hall transformed itself into a hotel. <laughs> tavern, hold holders, tavern holders thumbed their nose at Tierra. Ten beers... This is Roosevelt's own words. Ten beers and one hard-boiled egg scarcely constitute a meal. In fact, Tammany judges disagreed. One actually stated that 17 beers and a pretzel were sufficiently nourishing to qualify. When T.R. left um, as something less than a total success, this is what the Washington Post said about him. He's still not a national figure. He's a fighter, a man of indomitable pluck and energy. A field of immeasurable usefulness awaits him. Will he find it? Well, that's a question, no doubt, that he himself asked himself. He did find it. Um, he became William McKinley's Assistant Secretary of the Navy. And in 1898, when war with Spain loomed on the horizon, uh, McKinley asked for 125,000 volunteers. Over a million men rushed to, to uh, respond to his call. T.R. was one of them. Uh, he organized a group uh, formerly known as the First U.S. Volunteer Cavalry, but immortalized then and since as the Rough Riders. And it was a motley array of mostly southwestern cowboys with a sprinkling of Ivy League types like himself. And, of course, he had his great, what he called, crowded hour in July of that year on San Juan Hill, um, which was, by the way, a very modest uh, battle. The, the Spaniards were outnumbered 10 to 1, and uh, not surprisingly, we won. Um, and, uh, but you had the yellow press, the same press that had, in many ways, orchestrated a demand for war uh, now uh, flamboyantly covered that war, and uh, T.R. was a, a beneficiary of that. Um, not everyone agreed with his approach. Uh, he, after the, uh, you know, he, he made his living by his pen, and he, he wrote a, a book of memoirs about the war, uh, which were even more egocentric than most memoirs. Mr. Dooley, the great humorist, said they should have been entitled Alone in Cuba. Uh, <laughs> but by now, he was a national figure. He was a great hero, as familiar as the great song of the war. There'll be a hot time in the old town tonight. And there was a hot time wherever T.R. was. In, um, in 1898, the Republicans in New York were desperate. They were going to lose the governorship, and deservedly so. Um, and they were desperate enough to do something that they wouldn't have done in any other circumstance, hold their nose and nominate Theodore Roosevelt, uh, the reformer, to be the Republican candidate. And T.R. was narrowly elected by fewer than 20,000 votes uh, as governor of New York. It will come as no surprise that he was once again um, a champion of reform. Uh, he strengthened uh, this reputation by overseeing legislation restricting the hours that women and children could work, attacking sweatshops, taxing corporations, and extending civil service reform. Well, he was such a reformer that the bosses decided to kick him upstairs. Uh, they, they thought he would make an excellent vice president, which meant they would never hear from him again, and, um, and they could uh, basically go back to their comfortable ways. 